Joining us on the line is Holly Pivik, I believe I'm pronouncing it right. If I'm not, correct me. She has written a few books which we want to discuss, co-authored with R. Douglas Guyvet. One book is A New Apostolic Reformation, A Biblical Response to a Worldwide Movement. Today's show will be specifically focusing on the fact that it is a worldwide movement. And the other one is God's Super Apostles Encountering the Worldwide Prophets and Apostles Movement. And we're here in Phoenix. Holly, you're in Alaska. How you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks so much for having me on your show. We're glad to talk to you. Why did you write this book? And tell us briefly about the contents herein. About uh, 12 years ago, I began researching this movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation. It's basically a movement of um, apostles and prophets. They claim to have the same extraordinary authority as uh, Christ's apostles and the Old Testament prophets. What spurred like, you to research them 12 years ago? Did you have right. a friend? What well, happened? Well, I was working at Biola University. I was the uh, managing editor of their magazine there, and a woman contacted the magazine, and she was trying to find someone at the university, a, a, a professor there, who would respond to this movement because she had seen it becoming so influential in her own city and was very concerned about it and had noticed that there were really no books uh, responding to it. And so she was trying to find a Biola professor who would take the teachings, would compare them with Scripture, show where they go off. And so I was reading her email. It, it had come to me as the uh, managing editor of the magazine. And I thought, huh, this is weird. I've never heard of this movement. And so I began doing my own you know, research, Google search, and I couldn't believe what I found, how many websites, organizations, how many books had been published by leaders of this movement. And I realized it was this huge, influential movement that, strangely, I'd never even heard of, but apparently many people had. And as I started digging a little more, I even realized that people I knew, hmm. friends, uh, were part of this movement. And so as I started researching it, I started seeing signs of it all around me, and, and it was signs I'd previously overlooked because I had had no framework for interpreting these signs. Is it fair then to boil it down to say that the theological presumption of this movement is that there are people today who have the same authority as Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles? Yes, it is, and, and that they believe that these apostles and prophets should hold formal offices in governing the church. They should have the highest offices above pastors, above elders. They should be ruling the church. Here's what's interesting, Holly. It, it seems as if that's the underlying presumption, but it seems as if the way they actually function would suppress the way the apostles, they seem to go further beyond what Scripture ever has actual apostles doing. That's my reading of it. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that is correct, because, for example, they, they uh, see a place for workplace apostles in this movement. Well, workplace apostles are seen as governing over the sectors of society, like entertainment, business, media, politics. And so, is there an you know, apostle of like taxi cab drivers, <laughs> or there should be, or there hypothetically could be? <laughs> but in the church, you never see apostles. The apostle was a, an office for the church. It was not an office that had an authority extending to the institutions of society. So, so they are claiming a far-reaching authority that goes beyond what even Christ's apostles had. So, does that get into their theology of dominionism? Correct. Yes. That, that is in, in the Seven Mountain Mandate, the idea that, that the Church has a mandate to take dominion over the seven most influential sectors of society, and that the only way the Church can do that is by having these apostles rise to the top of these mountains, like, you know, the top of government becoming the President of the United States or, you know, and, and, um, the top media mogul and rising to the top of these institutions, and then um, casting out the territorial spirits, the evil spirits, they believe control these institutions, and they believe through that, through rising to the top of these institutions, you know, then the uh, they can set up God's kingdom. Do on they Earth. have That's any biblical much. examples of any apostles rising to the top of any secular institutions? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, I don't think there's any biblical example of, you know, again, of apostles 
uh, exerting authority outside of the church. Now, we um, wouldn't want to confuse this dominionism with theonomy, which comes out of a reform stripe. Do you know much about theonomy? Do you find these folks talk to each other or any overlap? You know, the, the uh, little I know about it, I, I, do, I do know that um, the, I guess, theonomists, uh, they don't like association right. always with the New Apostolic Reformation leaders. And I think the thing that makes uh, the NAR leaders' teachings different is they believe that the way Dominion will be established is through these strategies that are being divinely revealed uh, through these apostles. Because we have some listeners who are theonomists making the point to say that those fact those groups are not the same because sometimes when i hear people talk about this they lump them all together but they're not the same and that's what you were saying i'm just double clarifying so those listeners understand we understand they are different how does one become an apostle today uh, under this under their uh, movement well they would say that god gives someone the spiritual gift of apostle just like any spiritual gift but but that it is the responsibility of those in the church to recognize the person who has been given the spiritual gift of apostle and and confer on them the office, the formal office of apostle, through like a, a formal commissioning ceremony. So usually other apostles and prophets will uh, recognize, you know, will confer the office on someone. Maybe there's like a job application. Maybe you go on Craigslist. <laughs> super apostle needed. There is currently no super apostle over the janitors. <laughs> we just had a gap open up. Uh, but anyways. One of the least of the apostles should apply yeah. for that. Or you'd cast lots. Yeah, he was one born out of still time. So Mike, uh, we have in the studio Mike Pettengill. He has done missions work in South America. You're hearing Holly speak about this. Can you give some flesh and blood to this? What I mean is you've seen some of this affect you up close and personal. Yeah. Hey, Holly, this is Mike. I'm a missionary in Honduras. And, and uh, what you were talking about on, on uh, more of a, a theological level, I've got a lot of weird pra practical experience that I've never been able to put a name to until I started researching this topic, which, by the way, I got on Amazon and bought your book last night. Can't wait for it to come. Um, but in Honduras, it's really interesting because the government, which is a Catholic government, has banned a lot of these NAR guys from even entering the country. They don't want them to influence the people. And so it's a big deal that they don't have influence in the culture, but a lot of the the pastors at the ground level, pastors in these poor communities, a lot of the pastors we're working with are doing the exact same thing that everyone is condemning. And uh, we've seen in one community that I work in, we had a had a prophet come in and just randomly walk into one of the churches in the communal 30-person house church and, and uh, in the middle of the service said to uh, the man on his left, you need to allow your wife to divorce you because she is called by God to marry the man over here on my right. <laughs> and um, if, that, no, <laughs> if you're going to be a super apostle, does that really need to be your first act? And so this caused obviously great controversy in the community. And uh, about three weeks later, uh, he allowed his wife to leave the home, and she moved in to the to the uh, second man's house. And there's uh, a new website now called superapostolicmatchmaking.com. <laughs> <laughs> we've uh, we've also seen uh, a guy that's that's come in and he's prophesied uh, out of Colombia. That's that. Uh, told everyone that he had a vision that that um, uh, that all the non-believers came to their church and they reached out to touch the doorknob and when they did they all fell down dead and so that was uh, God speaking to him and saying that the church needed to go out into the streets and aggressively evangelize the community because they couldn't come into the church because they would fall down dead. The moral um, of the story is they were dead as a doornail. Yeah, very good, very nice. And uh, so... <laughs> Then we also had another another man that came in and said the Lord told him to, uh, he was essentially rewriting canon, rewriting scripture and saying that um, uh, the Lord had told him that the Sabbath had changed to Thursday and that the church needed to, to focus all of their efforts on Thursday. And so the church moved to, to two services on Thursday and none on Sunday. And it, 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 I love these guys. It's like, it's sad because it's affecting real Christians, leading people, but it's almost like they're like, I can outdo this guy. I've got a crazy scheme. You know, there's like, I, I just, I'm waiting for the guy who's like, my new vision is we all have to wear uniforms and the super apostles get like a Superman influence, like <laughs> suit. I can totally see it, you know? Well, here's what I, here's what I've seen in a practical, practical experience is that, is that, and Holly, you, you can probably address this more than I can, but, but I've seen 
time after time, you've had the average person on the street buy into this and say, wow, this God is speaking through this person or this person has been ordained by God to speak in this way. And so we have to follow him. This is the, this is the new way to heaven. This is how we, how we, how we make it happen. And then uh, a couple weeks passed and, and nothing actually occurs that the man said would happen. And everyone is disenfranchised with, well, this is what Christ is. This is, it's false. It's fake. And uh, they're walk, people are walking away from the church and walking away from the faith because number one, uh, the false promises that have occurred, and number two, it's confusing. They've got Christians in their own community, in their own household, debating whether this guy is right or that guy is right, or this is truth or that's truth, and it's 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 disheartening to a lot of uneducated people. What do we do, Holly? Well, and I do like the points that you were hitting there, that um, those are things that we do address in our book, that uh, the disillusionment that, you know, when promises made by these apostles and prophets don't pan out, they often... They often will single out a, a young man and tell him, you will um, one day be raising the dead, and you will be in a stadium with thousands of people where you'll be raising the dead. And, um, you know, one young man shared the story with me of how, because he was given this prophecy, he, uh, he decided not to move closer to the city where his young son lived because he felt like the prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled if he relocated. And he made the decision to, to live far away from his young son, waiting for this prophecy to be fulfilled, and it never panned out. And the, like you say, the disillusionment that that comes, and, and the uh, sense of spiritual growth as a result of that. The same man said, you know, I felt, felt like my spiritual maturity, I have years I wasted, and it was stunted, because I was focused on all of these things, and not on the true biblical teachings and practices that do lead to spiritual maturity. Mm. Holly, in, so, your, in your research, uh, one of the things that I've sort of observed uh, from some of these, from cults and other kind of crazy movements like this, that when you get into them, there's great irregularities in two areas, financial and sexual. Uh, did your research uh, uncover any hmm. irregularities in those two areas? Well, you know, um, we our book, did discuss um, um, some of the sexual moral failings of uh, some of the um, prominent leaders in the movement, some of the prominent uh, prophets like uh, Bob Jones and Paul Kane. These are two, uh, have been two very highly regarded prophets in the movement. Um, Bob Jones in particular, uh, he, Mike Bickle has continually referred to Bob Jones as one of his two spiritual fathers, the other being Paul Kane. And Bob Jones was very, his prophecies were very uh, pivotal in the formation of IHOP in its early years, the International House of Prayer. And that's the dudes and, out of KC, right? Uh, that's right. He was a, he was a, a Kansas City prophet, and um, he... he uh, they definitely need jerseys, by the way. That sounds like <laughs> Kansas City prophets, right? Okay, go ahead. But Bob Jones early on uh, was, was uh, accused and uh, apparently found guilty of having women undress in his office so he could deliver prophetic words to these women. Oh, my gosh. You can't do it unless they're naked. Don't you guys know? It doesn't, the, this, it does, the power, so it doesn't work. It doesn't. And this was the, but this was the, the same time, around the same time surrounding, he was delivering all these prophecies that were supposedly very formative in in. Uh, pivotal in the formation of the International House of Prayer. Hey, if it works. And, 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 Bob, and Bob Jones recently died, and his his uh, funeral was broadcast by God TV internationally. Ooh. It was attended by prominent NARA leaders, um, and including Mike Bickle. And after this significant moral failing, and it, it raises the question, you know, what... What would disqualify someone from being seen as a prophet in this movement? And he's not just any prophet. Bob Jones is held up as one of the most important prophets. In and then this movement. F financial, did you just in a big picture? Did you discover any uh, uh, as you had the sexual now grave financial mm -hmm. misdealings? You know, that's not something that that was in the scope of our books. We didn't look at directly. One, I, so the one thing our book did touch on about finances is. When a church joins an apostolic network, they voluntarily submit to the authority of an apostle and join a network, and they're expected to give, that church is expected, um, in some cases, to give maybe 5 to 10% of its, of its um, annual income to the apostle. 
And so you can see in, in you know, when you have apostolic networks that in some cases, in, in the case of Harvest International Ministry, has 20,000 churches in its network, and each church is expected to give a percentage of its income to the apostle, you can, you know, you can see that there can be money involved here. But, but yeah, they got they got the uh, Amway thing going on. If that's <laughs> the case, it'd be good to like appoint the m- more apostles that you could, you know, so you can get more dudes under you in the triangle. But, and right, the- and so it's not it's something that can be looked at. We didn't get into the particular motives of of the people and all of that. But Holly, this is Mike the missionary. Didn't you? Um, uh, one thing that I. In researching this topic, I saw that you talked about that I've seen a lot in in uh, Latin America was the the end time transfer of wealth. Is is that something's a big deal? And that that if that's accurate, then I know that when you're living in a culture like Honduras, where the average person is living off of ten ten dollars a day, the promise of someday you're not going to be poor again is very appealing. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned that teaching. The great end time transfer of wealth is one of the popular prophecies in this movement, and it's the idea that in the end time, God will transfer control of the world's wealth from the hands of the wicked to the righteous, uh, you know, uh, to the apostles and prophets and their followers, so that they have the money, the resources that are needed to set up God's physical kingdom on earth. And so um, that definitely um, plays into the prosperity gospel teaching, and, uh, and a lot of people want to be they want to be in on this great end time transfer of wealth. And so there's actually something, I think it's called like the kingdom economics, uh, kingdom economic yearly summit at the keys conference that's held each year where people in this movement, um, take part so they can learn business people so they can learn how they can help facilitate this transfer. So that's a very popular, uh, teaching in this movement. Holly and uh, maybe Mikey can also chip in on this as, uh, as well as you want. I mean, how do you, how have you, have you found people, um, begin to move away from this? Like, how do you help almost de- um, de-brainwash people from uh, from from really being drawn in uh, into these movements? What what needs to happen? Is it just by revealing sort of the 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 errors that are there? What, what needs to happen for that to happen? You know, in, in my experience, it can, it can be very hard and it can take a long time for people's eyes to, to start being opened. I, I encourage people to be, if they have a, a loved one or a friend who's part of this movement, to just be consistent in challenging the person gently with scripture. And, um, just, you know, when they, when they say a certain teaching, where can that be supported in scripture? And, um, you know, it's it's common for people when they're first confronted on these beliefs to get defensive and, um, and it even seem like they're not listening. But in my experience, um, I, I think sometimes when they're just gently and consistently confronted with scripture, that can kind of chip away in their mind, and they you may not even be able to tell, but in their mind it, it is working, and um, and they'll start to question the teachings. Um, and so I just encourage people to keep ca- challenging them with Scripture, but to do it gently, because one thing leaders in this movement do is they will demonize their opponents. Oh, yeah. And they will say that if you question their teaching or their authority, that you're motivated by this powerful demon called the spirit of religion. And so and so you have to be gentle and, and kind when you do this, because you don't want to play into that um, hmm. depiction that they are giving of their critics as being hateful and evil. Um, and if you and if you're loving and kind, that, that alone can um, kind of, I think, open the eyes of people, because they'll say, hey, wait, my leader is saying that this is a bad, evil person, but this is a loving person. And, hmm. and even that will, might make them start to um, kind of wonder about what their leaders are telling them, if that makes sense. Yeah, in Appendix C of God's Super Apostles, you have a, an, an index of all the names they call you. And we had Doug, uh, a Doug on. I called him all those names. I thought it was quite fun, actually. But this I is, heard that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was funny. That was fun. I enjoyed it. Doug took it well. I, enjo- I enjoyed the book and the work. Uh, now, I want people to just reiterate, we only have a few minutes left, but this is a big, not only in South America, but also in Africa. I mean... This is a global thing. This is a global movement. Church growth researchers uh, at the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, they will say that this represents, this is part of the fastest growing segment of Christianity worldwide. And it's part of that segment. And and honestly, NAR churches are responsible for much of the explosive church growth that we hear about in Africa and Asia and Latin America. 
most people don't know that. That's a and tragedy. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's something that, uh, even though a lot of people haven't heard of the New Apostolic Reformation by that name, um, it is a huge movement and people need to be aware of it. Would we call it a cult? I mean, why, why do we assume it's a Christian movement? Well, there, there, people have to understand there are different ways of defining a cult. Some people use what the sociological definition of a cult, which is a group that has uh, leaders that um, exert, you know, undue influence and authority over their followers. That's a sociological definition of a cult. And, and by that definition, some would say, yeah, the NAR is a cult because in, they, these leaders claim this extraordinary authority and in some cases real spiritual abuse, abuse has been suffered as a result of that. I don't really prefer that definition of a cult because I think it's too, um, too subjective. The definition I prefer is a theological definition of a, of a cult, which would be to say that a group claims to be Christian, but they deny essential doctrines of Christianity, like the Trinity right. or the deity of Christ. And according to that definition, I would I would not classify this movement as a cult because I generally don't see most of the leaders denying classically orthodox doctrines. However, they have added a number of teachings that I think are aberrant, which means that they can't be supported in Scripture and they're, and they're harmful teachings. That hey, Holly, seriously. thank you so much. Really appreciate you uh, coming on. Um, you have a blog. Uh, what's the name of that blog if people want to read more? Yes, it's uh, Spirit. Joining us on the line is Holly Pivik, I believe I'm pronouncing it right. If I'm not, correct me. She has written a few books which we want to discuss, co-authored with R. Douglas Guyvet. One book is A New Apostolic Reformation, a biblical response to a worldwide movement. Today's show will be specifically focusing on the fact that it is a worldwide movement. And the other one is God's Super Apostles Encountering the Worldwide Prophets and Apostles Movement. And we're here in Phoenix. Holly, you're in Alaska. How you doing? Doing great, guys. Thanks so much for having me on your show. We're glad to talk to you. Why did you write this book? And tell us briefly about the contents herein. About uh, 12 years ago, I began researching this movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation. It's basically a movement of um, apostles and prophets. They claim to have the same extraordinary authority as uh, Christ's apostles and the Old Testament prophets. What spurred like, you to research them 12 years ago? Did you have right. a friend? What well, happened? Well, I was working at Biola University. I was the uh, managing editor of their magazine there, and a woman contacted the magazine, and she was trying to find someone at the university.